Paul has been laying out for us that we're all works in progress, right? We're all, we're all kind of growing. He's been addressing the church of Corinth and, and labeling them as carnal. Many of them were carnal because of the way that they were fighting and feuding with one another. They were causing divisions by how they were looking to elevate and promote themselves. And Paul says, are you still not carnal when you do all these things? They were still immature. They'd failed to move on to this life in the spirit and they were allowing the flesh to still kind of govern much of what they were doing. They were drawing party lines in the church and there was nothing but a party happening there at the church. And so Paul wanted them to see clearly, first of all, that these leaders that they esteemed highly were nothing but just instruments and tools in the Lord's hands that God was working through. Uh, some of them might have planted, some of them might have watered that seed, but it's God that gave the increase. The, the glory is the Lord's. We're not to put the glory in other people, and this is what they were doing. More so, not just glorying in other people, but they were looking to glory in themselves because they thought, we're following the right person and you're not. And it was just causing a mess in the church. So Paul, as he continues on this theme of addressing some of the, 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 the division that's going on in the church, he's looking to correct these unhealthy views of one another and, and ultimately to bring us to this point of understanding, first of all, how we build upon Christ, what we have through Christ, and who we are in Christ. Three things we're gonna look at here today. How we build upon Christ, what we have in Christ, and who we are in Christ. So he says, first of all, verse 12, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it'll be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So Paul says that this foundation that you're to build your life upon has already been laid. What was that foundation that was laid? Somebody? Jesus Christ. There, there you go. It's just the favorite Sunday school answer. You don't know. Just the yellow Jesus. 99% of the time, you're going to be right. I threw you a soft one here today. Jesus. Verse 11, Paul makes that clear, right? He says there, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation that's been laid. Everything is to be built now up upon Jesus Christ. And so Paul begins to lay out some of the material you can build. Now, here's the thing is that you can have a good solid foundation, but still build with wrong materials upon that foundation. You might have a good solid base, but what's going on that still matters. You could build a house out of balsa wood, right? But that's not going to stand the storms of life. That's not going to withstand. I, 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 every time I think about that, I think of Stephen Wright, the comedian, who says, one day I'd love to build a house out of balsa wood so that when neighborhood kids are coming by and they're just causing problems, I can just pick up my house over my head and go, I'm going to throw this on you if you guys don't leave, right? Wouldn't that be fun to do that and have a house you just pick up over your head? Just be like, don't mess with me. That'd be fun. But a balsa wood house is not going to do the job. It could be sitting on a solid concrete foundation, but the material is still wrong. It's not meshing, you see. It's not going to help. We've got to build upon that which is meshing with and linked to that foundation already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul gives a few of those materials here. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay straw. He lumps them all together to where we're going, okay, well, what does this mean? What does it mean for me? What's What's the material that we're to be building with? How does that relate to us? And Paul, Paul seems to be making it a difference between some material that's going to stand through the fire, withstand the fire, and other material that's not. It's going to get burned up, right? It's combustible. So you look at the gold, the silver, the precious stones. These are all things that are going to stand through the fire. They're, they're, they're precious metals. They're something that's durable, that's strong, and that's not just temporary. It's not just going to burn away. Whereas the, the wood, the hay, the straw is all material that you don't want to be building upon. At least that's what the three little pig story reminds us of, right? <laughs> One pig builds his house with straw and other with sticks. Man, that wolf blew it down. The, the one built with bricks, something that was solid, something that was durable. 
And this is what Paul's getting at here, is that there's material that you can build upon that's going to be durable, that's going to stand through and, and have greater value to it, and other stuff that's just not going to be, it's temporary. There's nothing lasting that's going to come from it. So what does the wood, the hay, and the straw really then represent for us? How does that relate to us and our lives in building upon this foundation of Christ? Well, they represent the work that we might do that, again, is very temporary, and it doesn't have any eternal value to it. Yeah, our lives are meant to be lived in a way where there is eternal value linked and associated with it. We may be looking like we're, you know, serving the Lord in great ways, like we're doing all this great stuff. But here's the thing, is the things that we're doing can be nothing more than wood, hay, and straw if we're doing it unto ourselves and for us and not unto the Lord. It becomes very temporal if it's being done with the wrong motives and out of the wrong heart. It loses all value. We might look like it's very spiritual, but if it's being done more for us than it is for the Lord, and it's being done with ulterior motives with a wrong heart, it's temporal. There's nothing lasting or of value to it in eternity. In other words, you could be looking to sign up for the worship team only because you're looking to land a Christian record deal. If that's the case, boom, reward's gone, right? You're not doing that for the Lord. You could be out there witnessing and sharing your faith with people only because you want to get in arguments and show your apologetic prowess and look at how smart and wise you are and tear people down. And if that's your goal, your, your reason for doing it, boom, reward's gone. You could be looking to serve in the coffee ministry for our first service only because you're looking to meet girls and find a wife, right? And that's <laughs> then... Well, that actually could maybe be a pass. It's hard out there these days for young people. <laughs> Singles, it's tough, man. That might be the, the way in coffee ministry. Okay, well, just, I don't know. It, the Lord knows your heart though, right? God understands why you're doing it, for what reason and motive and, and desire. What are you trying to get out of it or what are you trying to put into it? Anytime that we serve the Lord with a wrong heart or wrong motive, when it's done for us, and not for him, it weakens the work, it doesn't mess with the foundation that we're to be building on, and it loses this eternal value and reward. It becomes very temporary. It's not the way that our lives are, are to be lived. And you see, the people that Paul was contending with here were looking you know, to be very spiritual by how they were aligning themselves with different leaders, right? This has been kind of the the reoccurring theme through these first three chapters of 1 Corinthians where some are saying, oh, I follow Paul. He's the, he's the guy that started the church here in Corinth. He's the one that shared the gospel with us. Oh, Paul's the guy to follow. No, 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 we follow Paul's. He's so mighty and wise in scriptures. He goes really deep, man. Like we're following a Paul's because we're getting so much more out of the word. No, 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 no. You got to follow Peter. He's the closest link to Jesus, one of the original 12. We got to follow Peter. And they were all looking to show how spiritual they were. And they were looking to elevate themselves based on who they were following. When all along, they're losing this eternal reward because it wasn't about Jesus. It was about themselves. It was about puffing themselves up and bragging in themselves. They were looking to promote themselves rather than promote Jesus. And thus, that work, anything they did, was nothing more than wood, hay, and straw. It was just combustible, losing its value because it wasn't centered around Jesus. Now, I know you're all looking to get into what Paul addresses in verse 13 with the day that will declare it because it'll be revealed by fire. What's, what's the day? What are we talking about there? What's this fire that we have to go through? What is this all about? Well, understand this, that all of our works that we do as, as believers are one day going to be tested. They're gonna go through this fire. And this, I believe, speaks of the day that we stand before Jesus. This is the day that Paul is addressing here. It's a specific day, it's, a, it's not a day, it's the day, capitalized D in the, in the New King James Version at least, the day, this is a specific day, it's the day that we will see Jesus face to face when we're gonna be before him. And when we stand before him, we're gonna have all of our works evaluated and tested. This is not about seeing if your works get you into heaven. Please don't read into that that way. This is a, 
a, a wrong view. We do not work to earn our way into salvation. That's already been done in and through Jesus Christ who died on the cross to save you, to pay the penalty for your sin and to secure eternal life for all those that put their trust in Jesus. The work, Jesus said, was finished when he said that on the cross. The work is done. There's nothing more that we add to it. Whenever we try to add to that work, we are building upon that foundation with wood, hay, and straw. It has no value to it. The work's already been done. So this is not about standing before Jesus to see, am I going to make it into heaven? Have I earned my... No. This is about rewards and not salvation. This is about the Lord seeking to reward you for what you've done and how you've lived your life for him in this world. This day speaks of the day we as believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ. A seat of rewards. Now, the Bible speaks about three end time judgments. Three end time judgments. There's the first one that we'll see in Matthew 25, where it's the judgment of the sheep and goats, or the judgment of the nations. This, I believe, is, is as scripture teaches, is happening after the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, when all those that have made it through the tribulation, there'll be some that have put their faith in Jesus during the tribulation, and there'll be those that continue to live in rejection of Jesus. They're gonna be brought before Jesus, seen as the sheep and the goats, the righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous are gonna be brought into the kingdom that Jesus is now ushering in after the tribulation, and the unrighteous are going to be sent away to everlasting punishment, it says. That's one judgment we see in scripture. But we see a second judgment in Revelation 20, known as the great white throne judgment. This is now this judgment that takes place after the millennium. And this is gonna be a final sentencing for all those that have lived in um, rejection of Jesus Christ. This is when uh, the Bible says that the sea and Hades give up the dead. This is gonna be this final resurrection of those that are unbelievers. This, this judgment is only for unbelievers. And this is when they stand before God to receive their final sentence and they're gonna be placed in the lake of fire. Those that were judged as unrighteous in Matthew 25, they're placed in Hades, but now they're gonna be resurrected to stand before God at this great white throne judgment and placed into their final resting eternal place, which is the lake of fire. It's this sentencing now because of their rejection against God. That's for unbelievers. But then there's a judgment for believers only, and that is the judgment seat of Christ that Paul is speaking about here in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Speaking of the day, that will reveal it. This is a place of rewards. It's only for believers. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10, therefore we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So Paul brings up the judgment seat of Christ. This is to judge all those things that have been done in the body, meaning all those things that you've done presently while on this earth, while in this physical body, what have you done with your life? What kinds of, uh, of works have you produced that are going to bring glory to God, which will then have an eternal reward attached to it, an eternal value linked with it? This is what Paul talks about. Now, when he uses that term judgment, the judgment seat in 2 Corinthians 5, it's the Greek word bima. It speaks of this bima seat that they would have been very familiar with because the bima seat was a place that athletes competing in athletic games, and remember, there were the Isthmus games right near Corinth, the athletes would come and stand before the bema seat to receive their rewards for competing in the games. They would receive their, this laurel wreath around their head. They'd walk around and go, here's my, here's my trophy, here's my prize. It was also a, a, a platform there in Corinth where legal matters were also judged, but where athletes would come and receive their prize for competing. And so this is the idea, this bema seat. Those of you that that grew up in the 80s, I've seen the Petra, and they sang a great song on the Bema Seat, for those of you that remember. Anybody remember Bema Seat by Petra? Hey, all right. Okay, good stuff. The other servers were like, what is he talking about? Okay, so, um, so the, the deal is here is that everything that we bring to the Lord in that day will be proven now if it was done unto the Lord or not. Because again, remember at the end of the first chapter, Paul quotes from Jeremiah chapter nine, 
when he says there, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Why did he say, he said, don't glory in man. Don't glory in other people, glory in the Lord. Live your life in a way that brings glory to God because glorying in anything else is nothing more than wood, hay, and straw that has no eternal value to it. It's temporary. There's nothing worth in it. And so we see that all that we do in life can have an eternal reward if we do it to Jesus and for Jesus. Obviously, there are some things that you might do that maybe don't have a, a, an immediate link to, oh, this brings glory to God, you know. But in our heart, we can be just rejoicing in the Lord and all that we do and, and honoring him in and through it. See, we don't always know the motives of, of people and what they do and how they do it. We, we don't even know oftentimes really where a person's at with the Lord. That's why we need to let the, lead the judging to Jesus, right? Because he knows. And, and, and it's going to all go through this fire that each person's work is going to be tested to see, as it says there, of what sort it is. Now, this is interesting because, you know, we can think now, oh, does that mean like when, when we stand before the Lord, we're going to have to pass through this big furnace or an oven and we're just going to get, you know, all like, what, is this, what does it look like? Do we have to go through the fire? No. I think, you know, you remember what John the Apostle writes in Revelation 1 when he gives the revelation of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, the, the conquering King Jesus Christ. And he says in Revelation 1.14 that he had eyes like a flame of fire. I, I, I get the idea like when we stand before Jesus and when we see him as Jesus, it's just going to be with this loving gaze that he looks at us, with eyes of grace, but it's just going to purify. It's just going to remove everything that we've done that was done for self, and for our own glory, with just a gaze, he's just going to remove all that and say, ah, oh, you know what, that, that doesn't have any place here. That, that was done for you. That's going to be gone. But what you've done for me is going to have reward here for eternity. He says in verse 14, Paul, if anyone's work, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So again, Understand, this is not a salvation issue here. This is not about, have you done enough work? Have you earned your way? We're not, no. You cannot earn your way. You cannot work for your salvation. Salvation is a free gift of Jesus Christ that he's given you through his death on the cross, paying the penalty for your sin. If you've received that forgiveness, if you put your trust in Jesus, your faith in Jesus, then you're saved. And, and we should have an assurance of our salvation. This is not a salvation issue. This is about how we live our lives. Are we living it to the glory of God? Is it very temporary in what we're living for? Or is there eternal value attached to it? And you see, when we begin to think of life this way, it should cause us to realize that we're to be doing more than just trying to survive in this world and get by. As Christians, life is so much more grand than just trying to live and ride things out until Jesus comes. Sometimes we can get in that mode, can't we? Oh, this world is really wicked. This world is really awful. I just want to hide out under my blankets until the Lord comes. No. Life is to have so much more value to it because our life can be lived in a way where there's treasures being stored up in heaven. And it caused me to realize that God has saved me to live this life to his glory and to his praise, to be used in a way where he is seen in all that I do. And when I begin to see that my life can now have eternal value attached to it, I can look at everything that I go through in this life. Everything you go through in life, you can look at and go, even if it's a trial that, man, you would not wish upon your best friend, you can go through a trial, you get to say, you know what, God? I may not be liking this, but I understand that this is an opportunity for you to be glorified through this in how you strengthen me, how you take me through, how you accomplish your purposes and your work through it. This now becomes an opportunity for my life to bring glory to you. And if that's the case, then there's eternal value and treasure being stored up in heaven through it. And I get to look at my life and I go, wow, praise the Lord. No matter what I'm going through, God's able to use it. 
God's able to do something through it. And God's able to bless me even in the midst of it. That makes life exciting. Because we're not to be living our life for self, for our, our comfort, for our pleasures. We're to be living it for the glory of God. And God oftentimes gets greater glory in allowing us to go through hardships, but in allowing us to testify of him, to reveal him, to show him through those things. And when that happens, then, then God's purposes are, are prevailing. And you're living your life the way that it's meant to be lived. He created you, he made you, he saved you so that your life would bring glory to him, not glory to yourself. And when we're fulfilling what we've been created to do, which is to bring glory to him, then that's the life that you're going to be enjoying the most. Because his life lived the way that he's intended it to be lived. You're not going to find joy in living life for self, trying to promote self. It's in promoting and, and, and revealing Jesus that you're going to be filled with the greatest joy and contentment because his life lived the way he's meant it to be lived. So may we be having an effective work in the present and using that to store up treasures in heaven. Remember the, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 that Jesus shared. He talked about this master that gave his servants, one servant he gave five talents, another servant he gave two talents, the other servant he gave one talent. That servant with five talents put those talents to use, gained five more back. The other one with two talents put those talents to use, gained two more back. The one that had one talent buried it thinking, oh, my, my master is shrewd. He's surely going to want something. Else. I don't want to come up empty-handed. I'm going to just bury this so that I can at least present one to him. And the master came back. He was upset with that servant because he did nothing with it. He buried it. I think how often do we as Christians just kind of bury what we've been given and we hold on to it just for ourselves, just for our own little kind of contentment and we fail to put these things to work and invest it and use it for God's purposes and for his praise. See, when we begin to use it, we gain so much more. We have an eternal value linked to it. Oh, I pray that we may be storing up treasures in heaven. And it's the life that's lived for Jesus. It's the work that is done for God and to his praise and glory that is lasting. C.T. Studd said it well when he said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It's exactly what we're talking about here. We have a short time here in this world. Are you investing your life? Are you using it for God? Because only what's done for Christ is going to last. May we not just be burned up, singed up. Some are going to be saved, yet so us through fire. Heaven will have a smoking section. But... <laughs> I pray that we're not a part of it, that what we bring to the Lord has been done for the Lord and there's eternal reward with it. So we've been looking here at how we build upon Christ, but now Paul moves in to look at what we have through Christ. Verse 16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Now, you are the temple of God. That's some pretty powerful words there. And Paul's not talking about you individually and your body being a temple of God. Oh, he will talk about that in chapter 6. And that will be the case. There's truth and application to that. But he'll address that in chapter 6 where that's the context. is you individually and what you're doing in your life and what you're bringing into your body. Don't corrupt it because you're the temple of God. That's not the context though of chapter 3. Paul, you see, when he says you are the temple, he uses that term you in the plural sense. He's talking about the church collectively. You, all of you, are together the temple of God where the spirit of God is dwelling in you. That's pretty huge. That means that as we gather together, this is more than just some kind of individual thing we do. We come together, and as we come together, we are making up the temple of God that the spirit of God is dwelling here with us and in us. Now, 
There's a couple different Greek words that can be used for, for temple. One describes the, the temple as a whole with the different courts, court of women, court of Gentiles, and the whole precincts. But Paul uses the word naos to describe the temple, which speaks of the actual building, which is uh, the holy place and then the holy of holies. The holy place was only allowed to be entered in by the priests who were serving in there. And the holy of holies, the very place that God says, it's here that I'll meet with you. There on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant that sat in the Ark of the Covenant, God says, here I will meet with you. But only the high priest could enter into the holy of holies. And that only one day of the year, the day of Yom Kippur, day of atonement. How many people sat there and thought, oh, oh man, what I would give to be able to be in that holy of holies to see and experience what it's like to be in the very presence of God. How many people would have given up everything just to experience that? And yet Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of God, the very holy place and holy of holies, the place where God's spirit is dwelling, he's dwelling among you. And, the, and he's saying this to say, there should be no place then for individualism, for pride, for promoting a self, for division, in, 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 in envy and strife that he's had to address in the beginning of this chapter. There should be no place for these things. You should be holy and set apart to God, not set apart for yourself. You don't come together now to say, I want this day to be all about me. You come together to say, it is all about God. My life is all about God. Everything I do should be all about God. Building up on that foundation with material that is honoring and bringing glory to God. But to think and see that now this church here that Paul's addressing in Corinth, they no longer need to run to men and church leaders to go, man, I need to really find security in Christ. I really wanna find some spirituality. I need to come and find what I can in and through you. Paul says, you don't need that. The very spirit of God is dwelling in you as the temple of God. You have all that you need in Christ. And God has some very serious words for those that were coming in and defiling this. He says in verse 17, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. If anyone tries to come in the church and build upon the solid foundation of Jesus with inferior materials with things that don't mesh with Jesus, with things that are actually defiling the temple, Paul says God will destroy him. That's, that's some heavy words. I don't know what that ultimately looks like. I mean, we all have these views sometimes, or more so I would say the world oftentimes has these views of God where the minute that somebody steps out of line, just like lightning bolt comes down, they're wiped out, Ananias and Sapphira all over again, that's it, don't cross God or you're gonna be doomed. Like we get this idea and we read a verse of this and we go, what is this happening? Well, it's interesting because the word defile and the word destroy are the same Greek words. Interpreted differently though. In other words, it's like Paul saying, he who destroys the temple of God well, God will destroy him. He who defiles them with God, God's going to defile him, move him away. He's going to take him out of there. You're not going to have any part of this any longer because the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And again, being holy is not about attending to some spiritual elitism. It's about being separated unto God, set apart unto God. Don't set yourself apart based on other people as the church of Corinth were doing. Oh, I follow this person, oh, I follow that person. Set yourself apart unto God. Walk in holiness. Don't defile the temple with, with inferior materials that you might be trying to build upon. Build it up on Jesus Christ. You are this temple, so act accordingly, he says. Verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Now, as we've been looking at the way we must build upon the foundation, we must continuously remind ourselves that it's not up to our own wisdom, right? We can enjoy great business models and strategies, worldly methods of how we build a church, how we grow a church. You can go to conferences today about all, you know, uh, you know ways, to, uh, ways to grow your church. 
And God is never sitting there saying, yeah, you know, you should really probably check one of those conferences out. You guys really need some help here. God's not needing that. God doesn't need worldly methods and, and, and worldly wisdom to accomplish his purposes. God doesn't, he works well beyond those things. In fact, we've been seeing that, how the worldly wisdom is nothing but foolishness to God. Because he does things so contrary to the world's ways. In fact, we looked at some great illustrations not too long ago, a few weeks ago. We looked at the worldly wisdom versus the wisdom of God. And how God does things in a way where you might look at it and go, man, this is setting ourselves up for disaster. This is not going to end well. God, why would you do that? And yet, he always prevails. He always comes true. He always does a work that goes well beyond what we're able to do. Why? So that all praise and glory is only given to God because it's so obvious that we had nothing to do with it. That's the way it always needs to be. Because... We're humans, and, and, and if you think you're contributing, how much do we take the credit for it then? How much are we ready to boast in, our, in ourselves or in our work? But God works in a way that seems like foolishness to the world, but in the end it seems oh so wise as he comes through, and he does a work that is so evident that this is beyond man. Only God could do it. So that he gets all the praise and the glory for it. So Paul says, let him... Let him become a fool that he may become, become wise. Be foolish. Not like don't be, don't be an idiot, don't be stupid, don't be lame brain, but don't rely upon the world's wisdom. Be foolish in the world's eyes, but being foolish in the world's eyes is actually coming into the wisdom of God. Depend on the Lord. Lean on the Lord. That's the wise way. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. There it is again. Kind of reoccurring theme again in these first three chapters. Wisdom in this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, and it's written in Job 5.13, that he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, written in Psalm 94.11, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So Paul quotes from these two Old Testament passages to show that you can come with all your wisdom and think you're really going to accomplish something, but you'll see that it's, all done in vain if you're not looking to do it in and through the Lord and for the Lord. Again, that had special relevance to the false teachers that were coming in to the church that Paul had to contend with time and time again there in the early church. False teachers continually looking to invade and devour the church and they were coming in in an attempt to profit off of the people for their own gain. No matter how spiritual they came across, no matter how religious they sounded, if it was not building on the solid foundation of Jesus, they would be caught in their own craftiness and it would all be found out to be very futile. There was nothing to be gained from it. It was futile. See, the Lord knows all that's going on. He knows your heart, your thoughts, your motives. Nothing is hidden before him. Don't feel that you need to rely on inferior things to build you up or make you strong. We have all that we need in Christ. This is where Paul takes us lastly here now as we look at who we are in Christ. Look at verse 21. Therefore let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Now the Corinthians were putting a lot of value on human wisdom and gravitated to those who were exhibiting that. Oh, like that person. That person's really gonna help my cause. If I link with them, man, that's gonna really make me look good. This is what many people are doing. But Paul says, you don't have to put that kind of emphasis on people. There's no one person that's going to be worthy of us boasting in them. Paul's laying out, all these people are, are yours. They're, they're, they're gifts given to you by God for your blessing, for your encouragement. They're meant to build you up. We all belong to each other equally. This is what Paul is saying. Don't look to them in greater ways than you should. They're just given to you by God. They're instruments in God's hands to carry out his work. Again, some might plant the seed, some might water, but it's God that gives the increase. 
As Paul said there in verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters. I like that. He who plants or he who waters, they're not anything. Don't look to them in greater ways than you should be. That's, that's, that's to be given to the Lord, that kind of glory and praise. Don't forget that, otherwise we begin to elevate people to an improper, unhealthy place. So Paul says there in, in verse 22, whether Paul or Paul is or Cephas, they're all yours. Or he says, or the world or life or death, all are yours. Now, what is he getting at there? I can understand the life part. All are yours. I like that. More life. That's good. But death? All are yours. Wait, hold on. I don't know if I like that. It doesn't sound too good. What is Paul getting at here? What Paul seems to be saying is that now because we are Christ, we're in him and we've received all things from him. Everything is ours now. That means life abundantly today. When we receive Jesus, he comes to give life and life to the full. I believe that's something to be enjoyed today. But it's also life eternal in a future day. In other words, whether we're living today, life is to be lived in him and for him. Life is to be enjoyed in Christ, no matter what we encounter. Life, it's all yours. But death, how is death all yours? Because death ultimately is just our entrance now into eternal life, life with Christ forever and ever. In other words, for the believer, it is a win-win for us. Whether we're living, we rejoice in the Lord. Whether we die, then we are with the Lord in the very presence of God for all of eternity. We get to see him face to face. We get to enjoy intimacy with him like we've never enjoyed before. All things are yours, life or death. Things present or things to come. And, and you look at what's going on in the world today and you can go, oh man, this world is just falling apart. It's so wicked, it's so evil. And as believers, we get to go, hold on a second. This is exactly what the Bible says would be coming. This, uh, I mean, I look at the world and I go, that's like reading Revelation right now. That's pretty exciting. That means that the Lord is coming soon. Whether it's things present or things to come, all are yours. We know that we have the victory in Jesus Christ, that he's already defeated sin, death, the devil. He's defeated the world. We're victorious in him. He's coming again when we see these things going on in the world. We know his return is that much closer. And when he returns, we're going to see the kingdom of God established on this earth. His reign, he's reigning now, but one day that reign is going to be realized in full when he establishes and occupies the throne physically in this world. Whether things present or things to come, all are yours. We get to rejoice no matter what as believers in Christ. Isn't that great? I'm excited by that. It might be the energy drink, I don't know, but I'm excited <laughs> about that. See, life without Jesus just goes from bad to worse, but life in Jesus just goes from good to better to better and better and better. So, oh, <laughs> and the end here, and you are Christ and Christ is God's. See, when we have Christ, we have all that we need. And, and by faith, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Like, like Colossians 1, uh, 27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think it's 127, don't quote me on that, but it, it says Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have everything we need. He's our very hope uh, in all things and for all things. And Christ is God's, meaning that, that he's God. He's top, but we have Christ, we can't get any higher. We can't get any better. We've reached the top. It's all found in him. He's God's, it, he, it, everything's wrapped up in him. We're not climbing some corporate ladder trying to go, how high can we go? We're in Christ and we've already reached the top, guys. We can rejoice, we can praise the Lord. And I pray that we are living this life to the praise and the glory of God because it's that life that builds upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. It's that life that brings the greatest reward for all of eternity. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> Don't start to go, all right, man. 
that's it. I am going to live my life now so that when I'm in heaven, I'm going to be the guy with the greatest reward so that everybody's looking at me going, whoa, how would you get that? They're going to be like, look at my reward. I'm going to be like, look at my reward. Boom, look at that. Take that, right? Listen, we're not going to be, don't start to go, all right, I can really use this to my advantage now. I'm going to live my life in a way where I'm going to get the best rewards in heaven. It's going to be great. This is not, see, what does the Bible tell us in Revelation? Is in Revelation 5. Man, we're going to be given crowns. I think that's part of that reward. But we're going to, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be casting those down at the feet of the Lamb of Christ, who is the only one that's worthy of all these things. We're going to look at this and go, I'm not worthy. You're worthy. And we're going to be casting these down. But I want to have a crown that I can cast at the feet of Jesus to say, Jesus, you are the one to be glorified in all these things. And I pray we live our life that way. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's wrap up right there. Worship team, come on up. Lord, we come before you here and we thank you, God, for your word here today and, and just for the constant reminders that we need, Lord, of what we're living for, who we're living in. And Lord, thank you that these lives are not meant just to survive, but they're meant to thrive in this world. They're meant to live in a way that bring honor and glory and praise to you. And it's that life that actually is investing in all of eternity and storing up treasures in heaven. I pray, God, that we would do that and that we'd be empowered by you and your spirit to do that as we live, Lord, as this temple of God, with the spirit of God dwelling in us. Lord, let us not defile in any way, but serve you and be set apart to you, God, for your praise alone. So lead us now. Use us, we pray.